Um, so <laughs> I work with the Subway Bitter Creek Church Foundation. We're a, a nonprofit partner to the U.S. Forest Service. Um, in Angela's case, on the Bitterroot, we work with four different forests throughout um, the Selway Bitterroot Wilderness Area and the Frank Church River of No Return. And my role is to coordinate um, five different sort of volunteer type programs, the artists and residents being one, of which Angela was our third that we've had in our um, partnership with. Four, third year, fourth artist. Yeah, third year. Um, yeah. And yeah, we really no. should credit the Forest oh. Service for um, giving us the site. I was kind of the inter intermediary between our organization and Stony and the Forest Service and um, helping to get Angela out there. So really excited to hear about everything you've done and your process. Yay. All right, Kelly, yeah. bring it on home. <laughs> um, Yes, kind of just going off what you just said. It's I've been thinking about you, like being out in the woods and like wondering how you're doing, and so it's just really exciting to have you back. So welcome yeah. back. I can't wait. Thanks. I'm so intrigued with everything you've got up today. But to formally introduce Angela, will you pronounce your last name for me? Cecil Woods. Cecil Woods. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Angela is a California-based multimedia artist and writer. She brings her art and writing practice together in the creation of zines, illustrated books, and illustrated books. Her work explores themes of place, home, belonging, and relationship to the natural world. She's inspired by landscapes and humanscapes and the process of seeing both through drawing and writing. Angela spends her time between Oakland, where she lives and works, and rural West Marin, where she takes part in a rich folk music community and spends time in nature. Angela's born and spent formative years in eastern Montana. She's working on writing an a writing and illustration project that centers her early years in Montana and is excited to return to Montana to focus on this project this summer. So welcome, Angela. Right. And just so everybody knows, I'm going to pass this around. This, we've got a couple of like really great images of what it was like where she was out in the, in the woods. So feel free to like, this will give you some context of where she's been. Okay, so I've been, I had the privilege of staying in a cabin that was 20 miles from the paved road or so, and um, that is quite a journey, it seemed a little intimidating, and my original goal was to stay out there without coming back once. I ended up coming back several times <laughs> for various things, uh, the biggest one being mosquitoes. I was woefully unprepared for insects and had to come back to get a lot more bug spray and a mosquito net. <laughs> and um, I was there to work on a, a writing and illustration project and uh, it, it was really interesting getting to spend some time in solitude and uh, really be able to go into this project without you know other people's influence or even other people's presence in my world um, and to just kind of give this time to like look into my own thoughts and, and explore my own process without with complete solitude this is like the most amazing aspect of this um, time and the first two weeks I was kind of so excited that I was having a hard time focusing on my own project so I spent a lot of time doing um, just like some nature drawings that you could see over there just like sitting outside trying to live through the bugs in whatever way I could and <laughs> do some some gouache uh, paintings outside and then I was I was doing writing every day. I wrote um, about a thousand to two thousand words a day, a day, which was about like a, a total of like 150 pages. So for me, that's a lot of writing. Um, so like, um, I also realized that because I'm trying to write a book, I realized that writing a book is even bigger of a project than I ever imagined. Like you can write 150 pages and still not be done writing. Um, so um, I, I felt like it really gave me a good place though to work from because I was, I was sticking myself to so much of a schedule where I was working every day with you know, certain goals in mind for both writing and art and also I was playing my violin a lot while I was there. So um, getting to like push the limits of what I could do when all I was doing was focusing on this project really helped me um, focus my process in a new way where I was like, I think 
I think I can do this normally in my life at home with, you know, with, with the distractions that are a normal part of my life. I could probably still write, you know, a similar amount. Um, so that, that was cool to discover just like the limits of what I can do when I really focus. Um, my project itself is, as, as Kelly read in the description, um, it's focused on like my, my early years in Montana. So I'm looking at my childhood and my parents through the lens of that particular time and what I remember from it. Um, and I want to read a little bit to you guys um, from what, I, what I've been writing. So, I'm going to start with the intro to my project because it gives um, a lot of context. My dad told me that I was conceived twice, that there was a miscarriage before me, and he and my mom concluded that the baby spirit had decided the time wasn't right, had left for a while before coming back to be born. I'm unsure where I may have been in that in-between time, but I like imagining it, myself invisible waiting, myself out in the wind and the grass, myself blowing in the cottonwoods along the Yellowstone. I imagine myself uncontained from heaven, a spirit shadowing those two people. It's true that when I was very young, I had a sense that I had been somewhere before I came to them. They certainly told me so, but the impression of memory remains. The space of before birth overlapped with where I went when I slept. It was a wide, comfortable space, not overpopulated with dreams, but expansive. A calm blue dome held up on the edges by angels. As a child, I told it to myself like this. Before I was born, I was with my sister. We were considering. We were looking down from a high up ledge above everything, and we saw our mother and decided to be born. I went first. I write this as if I were in some way separate, as if wise-eyed, I looked at my parents and considered them. But I also remember a time when the body of the world was one body, my mother's body, my body. I rose and fell on her chest. The slow drum of her heartbeat pulsed in my ear. I breathed as she breathed. She held me through the first years of the world, made me everything. Yellow, rock, rice, white, tulip. To the world, the mother creates a child. But for the child, the mother creates the world. The landscape I came into was mostly grass, sky, clouds. I was born on the side of the road in my dad's Chevy pickup. I was born at an intersection, immigrant. Now there's a traffic light and otherwise not much else around. Just grasslands, the mountains holding Paradise Valley, an old saloon and feed store, and two roads going somewhere. In old books, I have heard of suicides buried at crossroads, but I don't know if there is any significance to being born at one. Perhaps these things do not hold significance in the middle of nowhere. Perhaps being born nowhere human holds its own significance. I was born early and quickly, not waiting for spring. I was driven to a friend's house and wrapped in towels. When she was pregnant, the Archangel Gabriel spoke in her mind saying, Angela, Angela. She told me she didn't name me, but that my name came to her. Later, she would tell us, I am only borrowing you from God. He is lending you to me. Putting us down to rest in the afternoon, she would sing, go to sleep for the angels are waiting for you to come and play. So my earliest years were spent playing in the yard, playing with angels. The high places of Montana seemed not so far from heaven. I have walked up on Montana's mountains again and have been graced with the same feeling. I have seen huge blocks of white granite resting in a green field above Ennis Lake, looking like the pillars to a forgotten or secret temple. But in my first years, I had no reason to think that the white pillared place was hidden or lost. Heaven and earth overlapped carelessly. So um, in addition to the writing that I've been doing, I've been working on these illustrations, which are very obviously not literal illustrations of my own childhood, um, but are kind of attempting to um, kind of get into this magical feeling of childhood that I remember and um, like 
kind of surrealist, you know, where when you're really little, you don't quite know what's real yet and what isn't. And all sorts of things are kind of at an intersection. Um, and so I have uh, two pieces that the people who invited me here have seen before, and then the rest are new. Um, and like, like this one, you guys probably recognize the Lady of the Rockies from the youth. And um, I think at some point in my childhood, my mom said something about a statue of Mary that cries somewhere. And, and my dad, I told this to my dad later, and he was like, oh, she wouldn't have said that about the Butte statue. Um, <laughs> but in my childhood mind, I thought that the statue cried. Um, so I drew that picture, you know, kind of like to look like a rain, tear rain of Mary. Um, and this, this one is inspired kind of the sewing machine one by my, um, like I was, I was writing something about like the sound of the sewing machine my mom would sew a lot at night. So I would hear that sound of the machine like running at bedtime and how it has like that kind of lullaby feeling. And then I was also thinking about the same, the same feeling that you have sometimes when you're like driving in a forest at twilight and you're like going through the roads and you feel like you're like heading somewhere to like your home that's, you know, in the trees. Even if you're just going camping, there's like this very cozy feeling of like driving in the woods. And then I like had like a combination of that where I was like realizing that the dotted lines kind of look like stitches. And so I was like, oh, I should put all of those into like one image. Um, so that was an inspiration for that. And then this one is kind of just like the, the wild west of childhood. You know, um, like uh, kind of that like building of homes and like kind of for me, it's inspired by the way we um, like kids play house, but also like adults play house and like thinking about my own parents, like they were kind of playing house and like made a family and in some ways they were woefully unprepared for the whole thing. Um, and so, like you know, just kind of thinking about all those layers of like home and wilderness and building your little log cabin home. And of course, I was staying in a log cabin, so it felt very on point um, for me to be thinking about this. Um, so um, Sony asked me a question when she came to visit me um, that I've been thinking about, which is just like, how did this place specifically um, impact your, your work and your process? Um, and I think for me, it gave me a lot of um, reflection on well, for one, Montana is kind of a sacred place for me because of my own origin story. Um, but uh, also just kind of a reflection on this like hunt for um, solitude and this sort of like American life that we envision that sort of this little house on the prairie off on your own in the forest life, um, which has this idealism that's built up around it and then also a reality of being very isolated perhaps at times. And um, I was here in the beautiful blooming summer, but I did think about winter and what that's like for people. And um, I thought a lot about solitude. Like before I left, people asked me, are you gonna get lonely out there? And I just didn't know the answer. Like I didn't know if I was gonna get lonely. And um, I did get lonely about three weeks in. I was like, I have been here for a very long time and I'm sick of all the things that I think about. <laughs> and um, I don't know, I just reflecting on like how people meet each other and like how being connected to others stabilizes us in life um, and how the hunt for solitude isn't necessarily always the best, although it has its, its allure. Um, I think that's everything I wanted to say. Um, does anyone have any questions? I have a question for you. You, um, you spoke about how you have a sister. Yeah. Do you also have a brother, or is there a story behind who the little boy is? In it's, it's not. Um, it's not really meant to be gendered or to be any of us. Yeah. It's just based on a stock photo of a kid that I babysit. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I just liked like the feeling of like, you know nostalgia like mm. toys we played with as kids you know sure. yeah, yeah. <laughs> i'm curious if you experienced any kind of like, creativity weariness you know, because yeah. you were writing and doing visual and doing music yeah day after day after I, I feel like I did towards the end where like the last week where I was feeling a little lonely I was also feeling a little just tired of my whole thing like everything that I was working on mm. 
I, yeah, I don't know. There's a lot to be said for balance in life. <laughs> Like just working on one thing all the time is like you don't you don't have more stuff coming in to like nourish it in a way. I did read a lot and that was that was helpful. That gave me like some inspiring things to jump off of. Um, but I also think that like spending time with people is one of my main sources of creativity, and being alone is like a different a different take on. Thank you for sharing that written piece. That's, yeah. that's beautiful. Um, I'm so excited to read more. Mm -hmm. um, did you, what What was your process for writing? Did you go through an editing process with it? Or was it pretty generative? Um, did you circle back? Did yeah. Did you belabor passages? Yeah. Um, I did do some editing and I did do some like big restructuring of my project so like before I left I had four parts to my project where I was like I know this these things go together these things go to the you know four different documents and now I have I think 13 different parts so that's like a good like um, I have chapters now and like an idea of what happens in each chapter and writing for each chapter not necessarily like the final form but there's something in each document um, <laughs> So that was like editing, uh, but I also just had like a, like a lot of um, open-ended writing. And like after you came and you were like encouraging me to just kind of go for it, I was like, yeah, I should just do that more. So I actually wrote um, longhand a lot more after you came by. I was just like feeling like it was flowing a little better, so I just would like write longhand. And then sometimes I would switch it up, like when I knew I wanted to do a lot of day, I would write longhand for a while, and then I'd type for a while, and then I'd edit. Dana has pointed this out to me before, which is like just about the time that like a creative strategy is working for you and you feel like, okay, I've figured it out, then it stops working. Uh, I have to come up with a new strategy. So that, a lot of it felt that way. Like, uh, like I'd be on a roll and then I'd just run out of steam and I'd have to come up with a new like take. Yeah. 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 So I'm not, I wouldn't do well in the woods. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm really interested in, you know, what's the day-to-day -day like when you're by yourself in this cabin? Yeah. Without the amenities that you're just like used to always having. Yeah, um, so let's see. There's no electricity or water or what are the other normal things that people have in life? <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, there's nothing there. It's just, it's just like a very simple ship shape, like pretty clean, like, um, but there are like a lot of bugs inside and like mice that keep you up at night. Um, so, <laughs> um, but, uh, when I was first there, I spent a lot of time cleaning because I was really like initially like, I need to get this place into like ship shape order. So I was like washing all the windows. And then I quickly realized that the reason the windows are so dirty is that when people stay there, they're killing flies the entire time. <laughs> um, and so the, the windows are just covered with dead flies. Like, uh, we didn't even re-scrub them again before I left. Like, I, you know, maintained as much as I could. And, um, my schedule every day, I would get up and make coffee and sit down and write. I would write till one every day, and I had a rule that I had to stop at one and do something else, um, which I usually followed. And then I would do, like, play some music, um, do some chores, usually around two, it became unsurvivable in the cabin because there would be so many flies inside that you would feel like you're going crazy. Um, and so then I would usually go on a hike. I The chores that I did every day were like filling up the water bucket. So I would like fill up like a seven gallon bucket of water and carry it to the cabin or emptying the filled bucket because there's like a sink that empties into a bucket. So I'd pour that outside. Um, I was doing the bathrooms every other day um, at two different campsites, which was actually turned out to be like a nice punctuation in my schedule because it like gave me a job where you're like in the afternoon you're like, what am I gonna do? Oh, I'm, I guess today would be a good time to just go out and check on the bathrooms. And so I would like, you know, spray down the toilet seat, sweep, and put out new toilet paper a few times a week. 
and I did mop, but you know, you can only keep them so clean. Um, <laughs> um, let's see, what else was, I didn't have a fridge. That was one of the big things. So like dealing with food, um, I had a lot of canned stuff and I had vegetables that are very shelf stable. So like cabbage, like you can have cabbage for like two weeks and it doesn't even wilt. It's amazing. Um, and, um, I had little boxes of milk, you know, those little horizon milks. Yeah. So that was like my strategy, I think. <laughs> I don't remember what my other systems were. Oh, also, flies resurrect. If you smash a fly, it just, you have this experience. <laughs> your, your fly story very much reminds me of the room that I currently stay in. Okay. <laughs> Is that a log cabin? Um, no. I don't, yeah, they just come in. How do they get just in? Just an old house. They just appear. Yeah, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, I was thinking about that, because you know medieval oh, people boy. thought that flies spontaneously generated? Like, they, they didn't know where they came from. They thought they just came out of nowhere. Like, that really seems true. Like, <laughs> but, like, log cabins are super porous, because in between every log, there's a gap. So that's how the mice and the flies and the ants and the termites and, like, everybody comes in and out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. You, you seem... Oh. <laughs> Is there something that you think you're going to miss a lot when you head out? Like, I guess the biggest thing for me that was a really new experience, which I kind of forgot to talk about, is watching nature change mm -hmm. over a month. Mm -hmm. And I've never been in nature for this long. And just like, there was snow on the ground when I got there. And then the snow melted. And the water was at a certain height. And then the, the water started to dry up. And like, the shooting stars, and the bear grass, and what else was blooming? Um, oh, trillium was blooming. Mm -hmm. And those all finished blooming. And then now there's like yarrow, or yarrow, and... Um, Aster. Aster, yeah. A couple others that like are just all totally different, like all new flowers like coming in. And that was that was pretty magical, like getting to see all that. Like the stream like had like when I first would like hike up to the, my favorite spot, Bailey Lake, there would just be like plants about this tall. And then like by the end of the time the plants are so high you can't even see the creek anymore. Like it's just really cool to see all those like transformations, like in the same space over a period of time. What did you do at night? I read. I mean, it yeah. it becomes dark at, at like 10. And I got up at like 7.30 every day. So I would just be up after dark for like 30 minutes. And then I go to sleep, you know. <laughs> but I just read a uh, big stack of library books that are all overdue now. <laughs> <laughs> My library stopped charging fines. And I've just been abusing that policy. <laughs> Okay, well, I think that's everything. Thank you guys for coming.